What the Tech is sponsored by Audible.com, the internet's leading provider of audiobooks with more than 100,000 downloadable titles across all types of literature. For a free audiobook of your choice, go to audiblepodcast.com slash Andrew. And by Stitcher Radio. Listen on the go via the Stitcher mobile app. For more information, go to stitcher.com slash GFQ. Hey everybody, welcome to another great edition of What The Tech. I am anticipating this will be our finest show. And the reason why I say that is because I took a mystery pill 20 minutes prior to starting the show. So we have 10 minutes left until the happy pill, until the magic pill, whatever it is, kicks in. We don't know if it's Advil, Tylenol, or something else. Uh, Please be something else. I am so hoping it's something else. Uh, with me, as always, is the uh, great and uh, the world traveler, Paul Thorat. How are you doing, Paul? I'm, you know, I'm, I, I just say I'm doing well, but the truth is I'm a little out of it. <laughs> so I guess I'm okay. You're doing well. You know, I would be a little out of it too if I was traveling as much as you have over the last month or so you know you've been all over the place the entire summer you were back and forth right yep and uh and now you just came back from new zealand and i'm going to vegas on thursday and you're in vegas on thursday how long does it take you to recover i'll let you know <laughs> this is the first time i've ever done this kind of trip so all of my previous travel experience it's like it never occurred because this one is just different yeah i i absolutely hate traveling uh, you're the someone in the chat room says you're the Anthony Bourdain of tech. <laughs> yeah. You, yeah. Instead of like eating like strange food, you just play with like really bizarre <laughs> like Chinese clones of like the iPhone. Right. So I love Anthony Bourdain, but I'm also a little tired of Anthony Bourdain. You know, he's got that kind of uh, you know gr grumpy guy shtick that it, I, is just getting old. I think. But um, it always but it always seems like he smoked like a, it, he always smoked like a couple too many cigarettes. Yeah, like a little like one extra cigarette, just like that ruins him for the rest of the day. Sure. I think that's what it's like for him. We can't we can't blame him on that. Uh, but this show, we discuss things happening in technology, not necessarily tech news, even though it is centered around tech news. But we keep we pick a couple topics. I think the pill's kicking in. We pick a couple topics and uh, we stick to him and we talk about him. We rant and rave. Uh, I'm a curmudgeon. And uh, Paul actually settles me down at times in the show. So it's, it's interesting to see. Because I know Paul uh, is very vocal about certain things happening in technology. Really? Yeah, a little vocal. I guess so. And today, I want to start off the show with something that happened last week. Last week was the big Nokia announcement. They announced right. the new uh, Lumia 920 and the 820. Surprisingly, I, I was... Where do I begin with this? One, I, I think the device is a phenomenal device. So let's take that out of this entire rant. I personally like the device. I think the fact that they're concentrating so much on the camera is a great thing. Yeah. Uh, and it's overall, I mean, it's what we expected. It's a Nokia device, so it looks pretty. Microsoft's uh, operating system on, on mobile is totally well, unique. Remember, that there are two devices, right? So... The high-end one, the 920, is obviously the next 900. It's yeah. very clearly that. And then there's an 820, which is kind of a combination of the old 800 and the old 710. Uh, it, it doesn't have a unibody design like the 800 or 900 did. And it has those uh, clippable you know, backs where you can give it different colors and all that kind of stuff. And so uh, there will probably be more devices from Nokia for Windows Phone 8, obviously, but you know, kind of a decent little lineup. Uh, as it is. No, I, I think it's great, and I think it's great that they stick to two phones. Um, I, I, they didn't announce pricing, which bothered I, me a little yeah, bit, but it I seems did. like that's the Microsoft thing to do nowadays. Well, actually, I think they were hamstrung by Microsoft, which has not announced the final details about Windows Phone 8. And so I, I've gotten a lot of feedback from people because I complained about the same thing. They didn't yeah. announce pricing. They didn't announce availability, meaning which carriers. And... They didn't announce the date that these devices would be available. And so people would write in and say, hey, uh, I don't know what you're complaining about. I mean, Microsoft hasn't released the final details about Windows Phone 8. Yeah, sure. Right, right. but that's kind of arbitrary. Why, why haven't Microsoft announced the final details about Windows Phone 8? I mean, 
this thing is supposedly barreling toward a late October release. I mean, how and is it possible? I, I believe that, that we was don't a know Verge, everything about these devices yet. There was a Verge article today that I saw. I think it was Tom Warren that wrote it, and mm -hmm. he was saying how they've already been delayed. That's not true. That's not true. No. Okay. It's idiotic. You know, okay. um, Windows Phone has always RTM'd in September. It's still September. The version of the SDK that's floating around is final. It has been for a little while. I, I this, this sort of notion that this is late or something, I, I think people should be impressed that they're able to ship what is essentially an, an entirely new platform one year after the last release of this. Well, you know, that, that was part of the criticism that people were, were uh, giving to Microsoft. And they were saying, well, this is too soon for them to release such a revamp. I actually, in some ways, think it is too soon. Yeah. In fact, I actually believe that they should have waited until, you know, the spring or something to get this right. Uh, that said, if they're able to pull this off, this is the exact opposite of what people are complaining about. This is actually, they, they've talked and Nokia has talked about how fast they move. And I actually don't feel that the Windows Phone team or Nokia has moved quickly at all. But if they're able to release Windows Phone 8 on October 29th and then devices come out within the next two weeks, I'm sorry. But that is amazing. But let me ask you this, Paul. Do it's you, amazing. Do you feel that they had to They had to kind of rush Windows 8 to a release? Well, uh, is it than... fair to say that they're rushing it to release? I mean, you know, Windows 8 has been in active development for a couple of years, in public development for about a year. But see, I think that's that's the misconception that people have because they released the, the, the developer preview. They're looking at it as that's the point of, of actual testing, when in reality it's not. They've been developing this for a while. Right. Now, the, 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 but that said, uh, and this is just a theme for me in general, I, I do feel like there's things you can complain about with Windows Phone, and maybe that's the discussion we should be having. So, for example, one of the valid complaints about Windows Phone 8, unlike whether it's late or not, which is a ridiculous contention either way, is why haven't mainstream developers gotten access to the SDK? In other words, they have allowed uh, a small selection of developers to see the SDK, to start developing their apps, to gain early access to the store. I actually, I really feel strongly that that's not fair. Yeah. And the reason they've done it is not, I believe, and actually I should say, this is a guess on my part, but the reason I believe they've done it is not for any reasonable uh, reason for developers. It's because they want to maintain secrecy about what's really in Windows Phone 8. It's because they want to follow that Apple model. Yeah. They want to do that thing that was so successful for them with the Surface. And I just, I feel very strongly that Microsoft is not, the company to do that. They're not Apple. They're not the same. They shouldn't try to be the same. It's stupid. And they are harming developers right now who might otherwise want to support this platform, which let's face it, needs the help by not releasing the SDK in beta form, in RC form, and then finally in RTM form. They're not going to let mainstream developers, mo I should, I should say, mo they're not going to allow most developers to see this thing until it's already done. And that's not, that's just not right. There should have been a feedback loop occurring yeah. with a wide audience of developers. And well, I, I really am kind of blown away by well, that. Do you, do you think that's going to hurt them in the, in the long run with app development? Do you think it's going to take them far longer to have a, an app uh, you know, store uh, that's the, you know, at the development level that people want? So uh, this is hard to say. I, I have to say one of the interesting side effects of this decision is that if you think about what the Windows Phone store is going to look like on day one when Windows Phone 8 arrives. Obviously, all of the 100,000 plus Windows Phone 7 to 5 apps are going to run just fine on Windows Phone 8, so all that stuff is there. But the, the, the selection of new Windows Phone 8 apps will be, by definition, two things. One is small, which is bad in a way, but the other one is really high quality, right? Because they're only allowing it out to this select group of developers. I mean, I, I assume that there's going to be an excellent selection, I should say, a selection of excellent apps and games. Yeah. You know, Microsoft recently revealed that on day one when Windows 8 ships, they're going to have 40 Xbox Live games, and they provided a list. That's fantastic. But what's the list of Xbox Live games that are specific to Windows Phone 8? What's that going to look like on day one? I bet it's going to be a pretty small list. Um, and, you know, let, it, this and, is a and, tough one because Windows Phone 8 is so badly in need of help. You know, and, and considering that they've, they've gone to one platform really i mean windows phone 8 is kind of it's kind of windows 8 you know it's all unified in a way 
but you now you still have Windows Phone Seven, yeah, being developed well, for right. Here's the, well, maybe I remember that if you write a window, so there has been some several million Windows Phone handsets sold. We know Nokia, I think, it was seven or eight million they've sold so far. I mean, we can extrapolate and say there are probably somewhere between 12 and maybe 15 million of these devices in the world and maybe 10 million actively used or something like that. Um, it's not a huge audience compared to obviously iOS or, or Android, but it's, it, it is still millions of people. So it's, and by the way, it's certainly bigger than the audience for Windows Phone 8 for the foreseeable future too. So you can write applications or, and uh, games that run on both, right? You can yeah. target Windows Phone 7.5, that still works. And I think developers will do that uh, for some time. And that's fine, too. But, you know, uh, the, the truth about Windows Phone 8 is that architecturally it is completely new. It's NT. It's, you know, Windows 8, like you said. Uh, from a user experience standpoint, the jump from Windows Phone 7.5 to Windows Phone 8 is a lot like the jump from Windows Phone 7 to Windows Phone 7.5. In other words, it's evolutionary, not sure. revolutionary. They're and, not and, and that's blowing everything away. Even though the back, you know, the, the 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 guts of it is totally different, it still looks the same, and it's a familiar operating yeah. system for many people. Right. It, it'd be like sort of like because it wasn't really yeah. this good. But if you went from NT four to Windows ninety five and back and forth, you, you you know these things are very similar. Yeah. Um. Under underneath the covers, they were in, they were completely different at the core level. Um. So. That's kind of the same difference between Windows Phone 7.5 and Windows Phone 8. Um, but when you use them, you're really just going to see, you know, there's no reason from a user experience standpoint that they couldn't have taken 7.5 with the same Windows CE base and just evolved it. I, I'm personally, to, to Windows Phone 8, I'm right? personally no more reason. excited about the Nokia device, the 920, than I am about the new iPhone. And... I don't know if that's because I'm, I, I guess I'm, I'm an enthusiast and I, and I like new things or yeah. that the device is, is more interesting to look at well, when you take an iPhone next to it. So here's the thing. Um, the Lumia 900 and by extension the 920, which is even bigger, is a big, heavy slab of a device. So, you know, I'm six feet tall. I'm a big guy. The, this kind of phone is fine for me, but you know, for a lot of people, that's too big. Why is it so heavy? Well, it's a unibody design. I think it's part of it is a side effect of the you know the elegant design of the thing lends to the the thickness and the weight of the device. It's a beautiful device. Don't get me wrong, but it's still big and heavy. But I'll take and it if the camera is what they're saying it is. That's, I'll take so, it. So, by the way, uh, that is exactly right for me as well. I feel exactly the same way. But the problem is, for a lot of people. They'll see that thing, and, and next to it, you could put a Samsung Windows Phone device or the Samsung Galaxy S3, my previous Samsung, like the Focus 2, and Focus S, I guess, whatever it's called. Um, those things are much thinner and lighter, and I think for a lot of people, they're just better for that reason. Like I, A lot of people don't want this thing that's basically a mini tablet that you know they're holding this goofy thing up on, on the side of their head trying to make a phone call. Um, it's just too big for some people. And so yeah. I agree with you, and I'm on the same page as you as far as the quality of the camera. If it really is there, and I think it's going to be, um, then that's going to put this 920 over the top. But, by the way, Apple's, as you know, is releasing a, or at least announcing an iPhone 5 tomorrow. The iPhone 4S is currently the standard in the, self, or the smartphone market for cameras. And I would be shocked if that wasn't the case for the iPhone 5 as well. So uh, I, You know, I'm actually... I'm a little concerned that they're not going to do anything with the camera. That they wouldn't, they're not going to do anything with the actual optics of the camera, but they'll add software. I, I would be shocked if it, there wasn't better optics. I hope there is, but I would be shocked. If I don't know why. I, I just feel that they might not change the camera, but they'll add software yeah. elements to it, like the Lumia has, where you sure. could, you know, crop Wide people screen out. photos, panorama sure. mode, whatever. Yeah. Okay. So, by the way, that's fine. Actually, that they're still the best camera. I mean, as of today, they're still the best camera. Uh, they're yeah. still the best. And so I don't, that's not really the, I mean, I'd be, like I said, I'd be shocked if that was the case. But uh, even if they left it the same and just did software improvements, I mean, it's, it's a great smartphone camera. It just is. So here's my little issue with what happened last week. Uh, they, they had the announcement and, and uh, you know, off the bat, people go to these uh, announcements, these, uh, you know, unveilings of the products, and everybody's comparing it to Apple. 
Right. You're not going to well, have but a, this, Oh, by the way, I, this is where you see the bias of people come yeah, out. Yeah. Oh, we all have, we, yeah. And by the way, I, I, I want to be really clear about this. We all have biases. I, uh, I certainly am biased in my own ways. And your, your opinions and the way you present information is guided in many ways by your experience. And part of the problem of this Apple-centric world we live in is that everyone's experiences revolve around Apple. And a lot of people will uh, take a little side trip to Android land so they can write a review and then they go back to Apple. Yeah. You know, um, when you watch these live events through a live blog or something, you, you catch that stuff. You catch people nitpicking about stuff that Amazon does. Even though if this was the same exact presentation but given by Apple, they would just be up standing oh, be, and applauding yeah. and unable to type because they were busy slapping each other on the back about how awesome this was. Yeah, you know? before, before I go into this rant, let me just point out, I have a Mac here for people on camera. If you're listening to this, <laughs> uh, just you're going to have to believe me. I got a MacBook Pro here. I have yeah. a Lenovo laptop here. I have a Hackintosh here, Windows mach machine, Windows machine, and I have Android. So I'm in every environment. And I hate that about you, by the way. I but, <laughs> <laughs> no, that I, uh, that no, I can be on my. I think that it's healthy. I mean, I, I you can't. Well, I can't. I mean, I look. I obviously I, I, I write about Windows primarily. There's no way around it. But what the reason that I cover competing technologies is not to belittle it and make Windows look better by comparison. It's to under, have a rounded understanding of what's going on in the world and where does Windows fall short. Yeah. Um, where does Windows come out ahead? You know, it's to be able to be able to be honest about it. You know, and it, it it's really amazing to me, especially in the wake of uh, the Amazon thing, where there's no way to objectively look at what Amazon announced and come away with anything other than wow, Apple's really going to have to respond. Yeah, to no, this sure, thing. and but and you people know what? still do it, and it, it amazes me how they'll nitpick, like the smallest things. You know. See, I've been um, I've been critical of Amazon's announcement, okay, uh, but but what did they do wrong? Um, I, I I'm i I've I've had such a bad. You know what? So let me just say this. Go ahead. I will just yeah. say this. The the reason the Amazon stuff is going to be very interesting to a wide range of people, on just the and, and I mean this in a very positive way, is because they're not Apple. And when I mean when I say that, I mean that in a very broad sense. They literally are doing, in other words, they're making something that's a lot like what Apple has and obviously competing directly with Apple, but they're doing it in ways that have nothing to do with how Apple does things. And I think a lot of people are going to respond to that. You know, no, I, sure. no Listen, way around it. I think it's going to sell, I, I think they're going to sell a lot of devices, but it, at the end, I, I'm not a fan of the interface that Amazon is putting on this device. <laughs> So, I, 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 but I know for a lot of people, that's exactly what they need. The, the number of people that are going to want to buy an Amazon Kindle device and rootkit it and put the standard version of Android on there or whatever is infinitesimally small. I mean, it's just yeah. a small audience. Th that said, there are still a relatively large number of people who will do that. It's sort of like that audience for Windows Phone 8 or whatever, Windows Phone. Reason being, these things are so cheap this is suddenly an awesome, cheap way to get an Android tablet. Yeah. And if that's what you want to do with it, get it back to regular Android. I mean, I think it's going to be as easy as ever, you know, just as it is on the current fire. Yeah, we'll, we'll definitely touch on touch on Amazon. Uh, but I, I want to go into this okay. uh, because I've been dying all week to, to talk <laughs> about this. Okay. Uh, so I watched the, the unveiling of it, and you could tell that the journalists are, you could tell who's, I guess, being unbiased, and you could tell who's, really there just to cover it and they really don't even care about what the announcement is you know there were some big announcements and big uh features put into this device the, let's talk about the camera and then we'll talk about the scandal that that's hit with the camera the yep. camera is i mean the features that are involved in this that you could actually crop someone out uh if Apple had announced that, oh, uh, listen, I mean, we would still you, be high fiving each other. Oh, uh, for weeks. Yeah. No, oh, this no is the greatest it. thing ever. I mean, these features and and th that feature alone is amazing to me. That you're able to take someone and listen. Who knows how good it is? But on paper, that's a that's an unbelievable feature to add to the device. Apparently, the camera is unbelievable, and right. they've released some images that are that are accurate images, and it looks great. The camera's optics look great. I think the software that they're using. Uh, looks great and it, people would be on the floor uh, having convulsions if apple had released this thing and nobody applauded nobody cared fine you know what that's 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 all right with me i i don't care i think the device looks good on paper and and that's fine so that night 
I, I'm just reading the news and I came across a CNN Money article. And the CNN Money article, I, I forgot the journalist's name. I, I tweeted it if anybody could find it. Okay. And I had I had a little bit of wine. And this is when I this is when I really get involved in this stuff when I'm drunk, which is 90% of the time when I'm on the air. But I, I the article said Nokia fails, Nokia Lumia device fails, something along those lines. And the article went around went into how this was the worst device they're ever doing and the stock has fallen, has crashed because of this announcement because it didn't meet meet yeah. expectations and it didn't have what people wanted. And I looked into the background of this of this journalist or whatever she is. I looked into her background. She has zero tech background. She's yep. a she's a, a finance person. Well, and, okay, but now I, I think I've actually read the story you're referring to. You read it. Okay. I don't remember it well enough to know if this is the case, but was she, you know, there are different ways to look at like Nokia disappoints with announcement. I mean, Th that's it may exactly not be about I think it was the quality that. of the phone, right? Was it, I mean, it's, it's fair to say that uh, there was a lot of negative reaction in the aftermath of this event because they didn't announce that stuff we talked about. And um, yeah, but she, what she was doing was she wasn't really saying that the announcement was, was bad because you know what? It was a long announcement. Fine. I, she was actually saying that the Lumia device is lacklustered and the investors noticed this and they stole their stock in Nokia. You know, it, by the way, so <laughs> if she is a finance person and she actually believes that the stock price has anything to do with yeah. reality, then she's a terrible uh, money person as well. I mean, that's that's ludicrous. I mean, the stock market is the modern world's version of black magic. You know, it's it's like something that doesn't really exist that is highly volatile and you know, go, you know, stock prices go up and down, shooting up and down uh, based on the strangest things. It's almost like a butterfly effect type thing. Yeah. And, and she should have known that. I mean, and she does know that she's not stupid. I just feel that this is just another person that knows nothing about the technology that's involved and but is just to, right. So, come, and I'm, by the way, now here I am making assumptions about someone I don't even know, but you know, you might, uh, I don't think it's an unfair statement to say that a lot, like this is the bias thing in action. I mean, a lot of this stuff is uh, Nokia, they think beleaguered, they think not Apple, they think they're competing with Apple, this company must be screwed. You know, it, it's like, it's almost like this roller coaster, you know, snowball effect thing where uh, you could talk yourself into it, like, oh, these, these guys are screwed. This, 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 this device, thus, this device is crap. You know, I I'd love to see what the device is like. I mean, I, yeah, I don't listen, think anyone had, had an unfavorable impression of it that saw it in person. Listen, I mean, who knows? We, none of us have really used it. So not sure. that I know of, I mean, I don't know if you've used it or not. But not, no. it could be crap. It could. It's not going to be crap. I mean, like, we got to be fair here. It, it's not going to be crap. It's not. But you know what? There's always a possibility of something being wrong with the device that really turns all of us off. But we can't make I, that. There, but we, I actually don't even think that's true. I mean, I don't either. But there is no endemic problem with Windows Phone and or Nokia's devices. I mean, even the 900, whose camera did not live up to my expectations, is other. And and by the way, is like I said, heavy and big thick yeah is still an awesome device a wonderfully designed beautiful device it gets comments all the time it's it's got this unique blue color people are oh, always sure. saying, what is that device what is that thing you know um people you don't know will call it out on a train or a plane or whatever i mean uh there's no doubt that the 920 is going to be a great device but there's also no doubt that apple didn't make it yeah you know I was just, I got so worked up over this because the wording, <laughs> the wording was just, just such I bad, right? I mean, it was just, do you, do you have the article? Uh, I, I got, I got so angry at this because this is what happens in technology constantly. Uh, it, constantly, this is what happens. And it's become such a one-sided thing where Apple could put out the smallest feature. And listen, I'm a fan of Apple. I like their products. I just don't like the coverage that they get where I don't know what it is. And, and I always say this, Apple has created this great PR for them where they could put a bag of crap out. I mean, literally a bag of crap, put a little sticker on there and people will talk about how it's the greatest device ever, ever created. Uh, and nobody's ever seen it. Nobody's ever used it. I got really annoyed at this article and I'm thinking, you know what? This is the problem that we've had all along. And this is the problem that every company is getting at this point. Right. If you put out a product, there's nobody has come near this product. I, I'm, I guarantee sure. you, 
well, there's, okay. there's a very small portion of people that have had hands-on experience, and it's very well, limited. <laughs> but the but, people writing these things have n have not even come in contact. And I would, I could guarantee you, she's never even used a Lumia device. Right. The writer. Oh no, doubt about it. No doubt about it. Um. Yeah. <laughs> so I mean, this is a uh, this is something we saw around Windows Vista, where we see it around Windows 8, where there's there's kind of this mindless cabal of people that for whatever reason have this bizarre agenda where they have to destroy this thing. They have to make it look worse than it is. And the unfortunate side effect of this stupidity is that they are changing the opinions of average people who don't know any better. Yeah. You know, I've often said that when you write for the New York Times or the Wall Street Journal or perhaps for CNN Money, that you have a higher calling and that you cannot be a biased apple monkey, that you need to present facts and not opinions that are inherently biased. And unfortunately, those publications, at least the first two, that's not always the way it works. And, uh, you know, these people, and Apple helped, I mean, Apple's a competitor, so they should be doing this kind of thing, but they, they helped to uh, create this perception that Windows Vista, for example, was way worse than it was, and that was very successful. And now people still look back on Vista, they, they refer to it as some kind of a disaster. Uh, well, in fact, Windows Vista in one year sold more copies than every single version of Mac OS X combined over its entire history. Um, this is happening to Windows 8. And so this is something that I am paying attention to now because I've seen it happen before. It, it absolutely happens to Windows Phone, which is a product I happen to care about a, a great deal. Um, it's fair to say that I am biased toward Windows Phone because it's so damn good and I don't understand the weird sort it's not even a negative reaction it's almost a complete ambivalence about the product from consumers you know um, there has to be a reason for this and I think in many ways the reason is this kind of chain of bias that occurs it starts with tech bloggers and mainstream press it goes down to the wireless carriers who are promoting one pr product over another for whatever reason it has nothing to do with what's actually good for people that you hear bizarre often repeated pseudo facts yeah like the reason windows phone hasn't taken off is because they don't have enough apps like yeah i a hundred thousand apparently is not enough apps i mean there's uh, so much there's so much that so much that goes which, into by the it, way yeah. ignores uh, i mean hundreds of years of understanding of sociology and how things actually work where you, when you have too many choices it's actually worse than not having enough choice and on and on and on and on and so it's just it's sad and, you know, unfortunately, time goes by and over time, you know, the iPhone, which has uh, uh, the type of user interface that a baby sitting in a walker could in interact with because it's so simplistic. And that's why people like well, it. Yeah. Uh, well, but it's retarded. Yeah. And eventually people will or rather Apple will evolve this thing where it adopts slowly over time features that are excellent in Windows Phone or in Android even that have been around for years and the people in the audience at the event where they announce those features will stand up and applaud as if this was literally the first time anyone ever did it. Yeah. And, and that is the effect that Apple has over the industry. And, and, I, and it's, it's amazing. Unfortunate. And it's amazing. It's amazing to me. I find it amazing. And, and the reason why I say that is because this was a company that was, that was dead. And they were able to turn their entire well, no, perception but, uh, of the company the, it's the triumph of marketing it's the triumph yeah. of form over function yeah it just is it's not and by the way uh, and god bless them i mean god that it's quite an accomplishment but um it's also fair to say that there's there's another side to it i mean of course with the iphone and ios in general uh it's so popular and so big that it has this cascading effect where it has become the safe choice you know um, it's become the choice where people don't even think about the choice. You know, even my own father has said, you know, he got an iPad and he really likes it. Now he has to get an iPhone. I said, why? He says, you know, for the apps, it's the same apps. And I'm like, it's not really the same apps. Yeah. I don't understand. You know, there's no real, uh, there's no actual benefit to that. Um, but he's, you know, he's locked into this yeah. mindset. It's, it's very easy to fall into, it, obviously, you know, because half the planet has fallen into it. I don't know. It, it's amazing to me. It really is. And my dog agrees. I don't know why my <laughs> dog is panicking. Sure. Um, so the Apple event is tomorrow. We're yep. going to be doing live coverage here at the GFQ Network. I, Paul's going to be on for a little bit. Um, what time did you say you're available? You said three and four. You can't. 
so I don't remember what I said, but I have some kind of a phone meeting, I guess. Uh, and I would, I guess I would be other, otherwise available. All right. So I'm going to announce what time Paul will be on tomorrow. 2.30 to 3.30 is my call. So All right. So way before that, Paul will be on. Um, so we're going to be what, doing... What time is this event? I don't one. Know. One o'clock. So probably like one thirty-two. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and people are already speculating, and this has been going on for months. And this is the amazing thing to me, that there's this one event. And you, there are a thousand rumors that come up prior to this. Uh, and the biggest one today is that there were screenshots of the alleged iPad mini. Right. Which, by the way, shockingly, looks like an iPad. Wow. Yeah. It's, it's a lot like the iPhone 5, you know. Uh, it, shockingly, it looks like an iPhone that has a bigger screen. <laughs> hey, yeah. no, wow. I that's, uh, that's, uh, that's a, quite an innovation you got there. Now it, th this is this is where it gets interesting. I personally, yeah, don't think they're going to announce an iPad Mini uh, at this event. At or this at ever? this event at this yeah. event. Okay, that's I mean that's the and the, the current thinking. In my opinion, if they release this device and it's you know three ninety nine, yep, because I can't imagine it being you know at at an Android level of pricing, they may fail in that market. Apple may. Apple may. Why do you Why do you say that? Well, it, when you're talking about the device, right? People bought, bought the iPad because it was the first of its kind. It really set the standard, and people bought it. And the reason why people didn't buy an Android tablet is because it wasn't as good as the iPad at that uh, price. Or actually, the simpler thing to say, and you're you're right. By the way, that's correct. But um, it's not an iPad. It's not an iPad. <laughs> I mean, I think yeah. that's the simpler. Thing. I, I actually think the iPad mini will be successful for the simple reason that an iPad is really expensive. And if people can get one cheaper, they're going to open up that thing to a whole new audience, a whole huge new audience. But and see, the iPad is successful because nothing is better than it in its price point. That's why I feel that it's been so successful. Not necessarily uh, that it's so great. <laughs> I'm actually not sure that's true. But Okay, okay. but let me, let me give you an example. If Android was as good as the iPad, iOS was, Android was as good as iOS, would Android have sold better in that price point? That's not actually what makes an Android tablet better or worse than an iPad, right? It's not just the uh, it's not the, the operating system. It's the services. It's the, all the stuff, you know. So, I, I think arguably, in in the price, actually, I think the, those are all factors. Everyone has their little uh, point at which they pulled the trigger on some purchase. You know, um, Apple has this nice effect where they they check a bunch of boxes for people. You know, compatibility across all of the services and the apps and uh, the music and the content and everything. Um, it's an Apple device. It's got an Apple logo on it. People like that, you know, so I don't know. I mean, uh, and uh, something like the Nexus seven, which has the latest version of Android, which is very nice. It has the latest, all that, you know, Google play stuff, which is getting very nice. It's not quite up to iTunes, but it's mm, pretty close. Um, that's a beautiful little device. It's inexpensive. I mean, obviously the, uh, the Amazon stuff is resetting this equation yet again, but um, I wouldn't be surprised to discover that the, the Nexus 7 did pretty well for what it was. I mean, um, I think Amazon, by being a mass market retailer, the biggest mass market retailer probably, uh, is going to reach a whole new level of success that other competitors to Apple simply can't meet. Well, there's also a couple of things. If they price point, I mean, there's two price points it could be, 299 or 399 right? The iPad mini? The iPad mini. If it's at well, $299. By the way, if, if, okay, but if it's that cheap, You've just reset the prices on everything because the iPod Touch has to come down now. The iPod, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you're right. right. I mean, how much is an iPod Touch? 199 Yeah, for the, what, 8, 16, what's that? I think it's like the 8. Yeah, I mean, that's... The lowest. So for that same amount of money, 199 you get a 7-inch Kindle Fire HD, right? With 16 gig of, gigs of storage, I think. yeah. Just speaking off the top of my head, I believe that's what it is. I mean, <laughs> you know, that's that's incredible. I mean, and also we have, and and the, you know what? I was thinking this is a seven-inch device. It's not. It's an eight-inch tablet. The the iPad Mini. The iPad Mini. Okay, whatever. But they're they're in the same. Is. They're in the same. Yeah, I, I don't know. You know, when you when you go down to the lower price point, does how much does it matter? Apple's never. Apple can never compete on price, so they won't. Apple will present this iPad Mini whenever they do it as a better device 
then and then and let's say it, it will a just Kindle be better. Fire. That's yeah. the, you don't really have to say much more than that. It's just better. You could buy this cheap Android knockoff, or you could get the real thing. And they can point to their ecosystem. They can point to all the apps they've sold. They can point to all the music and the content. And by the way, they have a good point right there. I could just so. see now like spoiled kids like getting angry that their parents bought them the eight inch iPad instead of the regular iPad. <laughs> gonna cause right 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 we're gonna have a really really right. sad christmas we're not in year. the upper five percent johnny yeah <laughs> you know i'm sorry i i don't know you know at 299 I, it's it's very appealing at 399 i think it's so, not for way, me in the same way that there's always going to be this segment of the audience that will never buy an apple device period because it's apple or won't buy an ipad because it's 500 dollars and up and the you know the midline price is 635 dollars whatever it was um there's also a big segment of the audience, a really big, million strong segment that would buy anything that Apple puts out. And there's also the audience that aspires to higher end Apple products but simply can't afford them. So they bought an iPod a few years ago. Maybe they got an iPhone. They want an iPad, but they can't co quite get there. That, you know, that's actually mainstream America, by the way. Um, if they make an iPad mini that's within $100 of the equivalent uh, Kindle Fire, Honestly, they're going to sell millions of those. Yeah, at a hundred dollars. Yeah, but uh, how about millions? Millions. Now the the Kindle Fire, um, there's and they put out three versions. There's the Kindle Fire, the Kindle Fire seven inch HD, and I think what is it, eight inch, eight point nine, eight point nine, inch? and nine inch essentially. So yeah. nine inch, uh, you yep. know, the bigger one. So they actually, it's funny because they they have the non HD version, which but which is not the same machine they sold last year. This is I remember there were all these. Uh, uh, rumors before the announcement, you know, Am Apple's going to pull, I'm sorry, Amazon's going to pull an Apple and sell their old one for cheap. You know, that's how they get to get into the low end of the market. Um, Amazon's already in, in the low end of the market. So the non-HD Kindle Fire they're selling this year is actually quite an improvement over the one they were selling last year. Uh, and that device, I think off the top of my head is what, 169 one or something like one, that? 159. 159. Yeah. So, you know, they have a, a device at every price point imaginable. And... I, I really just feel like there's a, even though we, we all may as Americans or the world audience aspire to these luxury Apple devices in the same way that anyone who likes cars might aspire to own a Mercedes someday or a BMW or some other expensive vehicle. Um, most people buy Chevys and Fords and Hondas and Toyotas, you know, and I, I think that Amazon hits that mass market in a way that Apple simply won't, you know, um, and that they're, the way they're going to maintain what they have is to always present themselves as the quality option. You know? Yeah, I, I guess that that's going to be their big selling point, right? That Apple, it's just a better build, it's better quality, and it's a better ecosystem yeah. I mean, do, do you want an iPad, or do you want something that looks like an iPod, yeah. iPad but isn't an iPad? I mean, uh, it's not a bad argument. You know? it's, and if, no, if, if it's, it's not. A, if it's not an unreasonable premium, there's just no stopping them. I don't know. Maybe I'm just missing it. I have zero interest in a in a smaller iPad. You don't understand. Like all around the world right now, people's wallets are magically starting to slide out of their pockets, and the credit cards are starting to fly into the air, so that the person can make that purchase the second that Apple announces this and the store goes live. I mean, um, I'm sure that lots of people pre-ordered Kindle Fires. I also think it's notable that Amazon has not issued a press release stating that fact. Whereas the moment that that store goes live and it goes comes grinding to a halt because so many people are hitting it, yeah. Apple will sell millions and millions of those things immediately. Do you, you know? feel that we're going to hear we're going to see it tomorrow? The uh, iPad the, mini. the iPad Mini. I have zero opinion on that. I have no idea. Yeah, I I, I can't see them doing that. I'm actually, I have to say, I don't mean to say I'm proud about this, but I think it is an important note on the way this market has evolved that for the first time ever, Apple will release an iPhone and an iPad, and I just don't care. <laughs> and, 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 and no, but the reason is simple. It, it's not like I, I, Paul doesn't like Apple now or something, or you know, Paul's turned the corner on Apple. It's that for the first time, it just doesn't matter anymore to me because there's so much more stuff out there that I care about more. Yeah. Like, in other words, I would be in the past harming myself to go with an alternate platform uh, of tablet, you know, an Android tablet. But 
you know, Windows RT is coming. The Android tablets like the Kindle Fire and the Nexus 7 are fantastic. There's just no reason to go Apple for me. And I'm actually kind of happy that that's the case. Not because, I, again, I'm trying to exclude Apple from everything that I do, but rather because it has taken too long for there to be viable competition. To yeah, these I mean, devices. we have options now, and we did not yeah. have that. I mean, even a year ago, we really didn't have viable options. The Kindle Fire had come out, and it really, yeah. you know, was good for what it was, but that's, every, that's what everybody said. Oh, every review was, well, it's really good for what it is. Yeah, and it, by the way, it still is good for what it is. Yeah, you know, sure. The, the Nexus 7 is good for what it is, too. I think the Nexus 7 is by far a better device, much better device than the original Kindle Fire. Mo yeah, but I it mean, came out nine months earlier. Nine so months now, later, But now yeah. that you see what, what Amazon's releasing for the next Kindle Fire, you, you have to compare to the Nexus 7. The Kindle Fire HD is better than the Nexus 7, as it yeah. should be, because it's coming out a little bit later. Are you interested in the larger one? Or no, I, uh, you mean the Kindle Fire? The Kindle Fire, uh, eight, the 9-inch yeah, one. The 8.9 or whatever yeah. it is. Um, not particularly. I, I ordered one to review it. Um, I Based on my own usage, I have a feeling that that won't be my device. That I will probably... Well, actually, I don't know. I shouldn't say that. I don't know what I'll probably do. I ordered a... a I still like the normal Kindle devices, the non-tablets. I think there's something to reading on a device that doesn't have a backlit screen. I think it's easier on your eyes. I think it's a better reading experience. And so I ordered one of those uh, Kindle pa uh, paper whites. We'll see how that goes. Uh, I ordered one of each, and so I'm going to try them all, and we'll see. But I, I suspect when this all washes out that it, it may be – actually, I shouldn't say what I suspect. I don't know. But I, I, I don't think it's going to be the big one. I don't think yeah. that's going to be where I end up. I just, well, I just it, what's the price so. on the big one? Two forty nine. Two ninety nine. It's probably two ninety nine. You know what? What's interesting, actually, what's not bad about it is that it has four G in it, built in. It has a LTE. Yeah. The big one. So cheap too. It, cheap it's LTE. it's really cheap LTE, and you know, two hundred fifty megs. People are saying two fifty. I think it's like fifty bucks for the year for two hundred fifty megs a month. Yeah. But compared if, to one hundred eighty on the iPad, by the way. Yeah. Uh, but if you're like me, and you really don't use your 4G that often mm. and you don't take your iPad out and, you know, you may take it out just for well, whatever. you don't have to get it, so just um, to be clear. But, I mean, 50 bucks a month is kind of doable. No, it's not 50 bucks a month. It's 50 uh, a, year. a year, I'm sorry. 50 yeah. bucks a year, is it, it's something that you don't even think about. You're like, you know what? It's not bad in an emergency situation. I still have internet access. Yes. I, yep. I mean, I, I can see way, that I, being I successful. can't even imagine how many people are paying... AT&T, whatever the price is, 15 bucks a month for that same amount of access on their iPad and not really even using it, yeah. you know, that, you know, they have uh, access to Wi-Fi usually or whatever it is. It's nice to have. I mean, there's no doubt about it, but. Um, so now the big question is, where does the surface lie in all this? I know. So, uh, again, God bless Microsoft and their inability to communicate. We don't know. I mean, yeah. there's no, we don't know where the price is on that. I mean. Um, I, I, obviously, Microsoft is letting these other players kind of line up with their pricing and device types, and they can kind of take a look at it and see. Because um, it's going to be tough. I mean, it's yeah, the conversation be... goes something like, "The Surface RT is never going to make it if they price it above whatever number you feel is important to you." Um, and then you can kind of counter that with, "Yeah, but the Surface RT is an actual computer, and you can run Office on it." And you know, you kind of go back and forth. And I don't know that I have a point that I can draw the line in the sand and say it has to be this. I mean, we need to see what Apple prices their iPads at. I, I guess the baseline for me is it has to be priced at or below comparable iPad. Yeah, and it, 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 I was going to say the same thing. It has to be at or below because yeah. if they're putting out, at, let's say, a 699 Surface. You know what it is? Uh, th this, people have completely misconstrued this. I, th talk about press bias. One of the things that has blown me away is the sheer number of articles that started off with the contention that um, Amazon is not competing with the iPad with the uh, Kindle Fire HD. It's competing with the Surface. You know that's insane. But and that's why? Why would they think that? I, I'm I don't just know. Curious. But let's not worry about why they think that. Let's worry about what the truth is. And the truth is this: that Amazon, uh, Apple, by creating this new market, has created a situation where they have this device that sits in the middle. And the thing that it sits in the middle of is, on the one end, real PCs, and that's. Every PC type imaginable, everything from a netbook up to the biggest all-in-one PC, whatever people might buy a computer for, 
there's a certain number of people that don't need that computer that can get that thing done on an, on an iPad. And so the iPad does compete with PCs, even though they're not directly comparable as the same kind of device. But on the flip side, the iPad also competes with these media tablets, things like the Nexus 7, things like the original Amazon Kindle Fire, and now these new Kindle Fire devices, which of course now there's one that e ekes up right into the iPad middle of the market. So where does Windows RT sit, right? Where, where's Windows RT? Windows RT is somewhere between the iPad and the PC. It's, it's not competing with the Amazon Kindle Fires. It's just not. It's not yeah. the same kind of a thing. It is a dual-purpose device. There will not be, probably, a single Windows RT device that is sold without a keyboard or without an option for a keyboard. Because people will see this thing as what is essentially a computer. Well, what, what else is also amazing is that if, if the, the Kindle Fire does not sell anywhere near the level of the iPad, people are going to say, well, it's not really competing with the iPad. It's competing. It is competing with the iPad. Because every sale yeah, of the Kindle is. Fire sure, it's is a sale away. that Apple didn't get. But, There's but, no way to say otherwise. That's, it's just not true. But I'm just, go, I'm just speculating on what they will write. What, what a lot of blogs will write, well, uh, Kindle Fire sells X amount. Uh, it's not near where the iPad sold for this quarter, you know, but I, look, it's not iPad, competing. The iPad, since it's come out, has sold more every single year. And so it's a huge business for Apple. But the iPad has also lost market share every single year that it's come out. And the reason is other people are selling devices in greater numbers every year. The iPad still has 65% of the market. I get it. But it had like 99% of the market when it came out. Yeah, and that's going to go down even more because the market, there was no market when they came out, really. Right, right. Nothing existed to kind of compare it to. There was no device that said, wow, the iPad just killed it. It was nothing. I mean, it, it, it's, it's, it was its own device at that point, and they were, they were the first ones to it. But yeah. when the Surface comes out... So and by the, the way, there's a, there's a bit of questioning about whether Windows RT is going to be popular or not in the, in the chat. There. Okay. I'll tell you this. Uh, the Windows RT questions are incessant and never-ending. And when we went to uh, TechEd New Zealand, that's all anyone wanted to talk about was the Surface, the Surface RT. When's it coming? Have you seen one? Do we have it here? Can we get our hand? I mean, this, this is, I, I really do think the Surface is going to be huge. Um, for the same reason that I think the Kindle is going to be huge, uh, the Kindle Fire HD, in that there is just this audience of people, you know, in the same way that there's this audience of people who would go into a Best Buy and they, they've heard about the iPad. They've seen the ads on TV. They've seen the ads that are everywhere on our planet. Apparently, Apple has taken out every vertical service on the planet Earth to, to advertise the iPad. And so they hear about this thing. And they go into the store and they say, I want to see the iPad. And then the question kind of comes down to, well, does it run Windows or does it run Office or something that is actually important to them? And when the answer is no, they're like, uh, yeah, I don't know. And obviously, a lot of people are pulling the trigger on those purchases, but... The tablet market is still, still pretty small compared yeah, sure. to the PC market. Still, I mean, it, that's going to change, but it's still small. And I think one of the reasons it is still small is because when it's just Apple, you're, you know, obviously they're going to sell mil millions of devices, but, but the they're PC still not going to reach everyone. They're just I mean, not going to reach everyone. It, it's been they already have their 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 foot on the ground. I mean, they they've yeah. been around. The PC market has been around for you know x amount of decades. That the tablet market. Oh, is yeah. a fairly new thing. So, yeah, I mean, the sta it's going to follow a much faster growth. Trajectory. Oh, yeah. So, and that's the thing. It's going to grow much faster. And I think Apple's going to lose a, I think a, I mentioned a this much last more week, rapid. I, I, I saw a great headline where someone said um, tablets are going to beat laptops by becoming laptops, you know. And I really do feel like that's the future of the market is that the, these hybrid devices that Apple, by going to a very pure all touch non keyboard based device, where the you know obviously there's a keyboard, but it's like an afterthought. You know, it's not um, it's not something that's deeply integrated in the system. You can't do keyboard-based task switching. You know, there's not there's all this stuff that's just not in there. It's just a very obviously a very early system. Um, it's just not as functional. And you know, again, yeah. for some people that's fine. Email, Facebook, web browsing. And I think that's, that's where Windows RT is gonna I really so. stand out. I don't think it's gonna be this. You know, the, the tablet. You know, like that we have now. I think it's going to be these, you know, hybrid devices that it's a laptop when you dock it and you take it out and you walk around. It's a tablet now. What's going to put, well, yeah, and what's going to put RT over the top is going to be a year from now uh, what the app market looks like. Is there a yeah. Photoshop that runs in this thing? Uh, sure. Is there, you know, those top five Windows applications that just have to, have to, have to happen? 
in Metro Forum, are they available? And if they are, it's it's gonna it, that's game over. But well, what do you think is gonna happen? Do you think people are gonna be walking around with 13, 14 inch tablets all the time now? Because I mean, obviously, a ten inch, a, yeah. a nine inch or a ten inch, you know, laptop is too small. So are we gonna have larger tablets dominating the market? No, no. Well, right. I mean, I think those larger devices aren't going to be so much larger tablets as they are going to be larger devices that happen to have touchscreens as well. I mean, I, I think the big change that Windows 8 is going to bring on is this proliferation of different hybrid type devices. You know, it's not going to be just desktop laptop. It's going to be eight different device types, you know, convertible laptops and hybrid devices and clip on screens and all that stuff. It's going to be just a different thing. And I, I, I think the truth is that Apple's model is one size fits all. And while there are some people who are willing to contort the way that they get work done in order to meet Apple's model, there are some people, again, who still need a PC. They just need to get work done, even if it's just sometimes. In other words, even if 90% of the time you could read email in a touch-based email program like you can on the iPad, you could browse the web, you could do Facebook, sometimes you just want to use Word. Or someone sends you a yeah. Word document from work and you have to edit it and send it back or you, whatever it is. And um, I think that's where Windows RT tablets are going to take off. My son is printing it. What, what is he printing? 180 page. What are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> All right, you got to stop printing. You can print. Right, it's wait fine. Until, wait we're done here. We'll, uh... No, that's fine. It, it, we'll, we'll do our uh, what if. Okay. Uh, so actually, uh, someone in chat wants to know if the uh, first generation RT tablets have a stylus. I've not seen one with it, but the the first generation Windows RT devices fully support the ta uh, all the pressure sensitive stylus stuff, just like Windows 8 does. Yeah, uh, I'm very uh, you know I, I'm personally before we go to the the what if I, I'm very interested in RT just because I feel these RT devices are going to change what we know as a laptop. You know, um, if you go back a ways and if you've ever, if you were part of the PC industry in the mid 1990s, uh, there was a movement back then among the sort of tech elite, among programmers, among IT pros to move from the safety of Windows 9X, Windows 95 at the time and go to NT. Uh, there were, I knew some goons that used like Windows NT 3.51, which was uh, just kind of a horrible uh, product really. But what the reason they wanted to use it was because of the perceived uh, improvements they got as well as the really real world improvements around reliability and security and all that kind of stuff. Um, I was a huge fan of Windows NT. Um, when I was developing software in the mid 1990s, I used to run uh, Delphi on Windows NT for the because wow. I couldn't crash the OS. You know, it was just awesome. And NT then is like RT today in that it's eventually going to merge with the mainstream Windows that we have today. But it's also going to leave some stuff behind. Some of the stuff you're going to leave behind is like stuff you kind of wanted maybe. But some of the stuff you're going to leave behind is the bad stuff, the legacy yeah. stuff. And I think that the, uh, the overall impact of that is incredibly positive for the industry. And so, you know, we may not see it right away. Not, you know, Windows RT slash Windows 8. But, you know, Windows RT 2 slash Windows 9, we may just forget the desktop ever existed. That may be the huge the huge get there is that the desktop just disappears do, do you feel that the desktop is gonna that that's yes. what they're going for because i yep. i was reading i forgot what it was it was an email or a tweet i got and someone brought up an interesting point they said what if these these hybrid devices when you dock them they're in desktop but when you take them off they're in metro desktop's going away it, I, I mean I think, we, I think we need yeah. to psychologically adapt to that because it's happening and we we mentioned it last week. I think the thing about you know, and they're not calling it Metro. The, I guess they're calling it the. They're not the, calling it anything. Man. They're not calling it anything. But <laughs> let, let's call it Metro so so people don't get confused. Yeah, yeah. The the Metro UI. Yep. I. I oh, by the way, I, I will say this for all yeah. the indecision on Microsoft's part about these names. The one thing that they did say to me right up front, well, not years ago, but uh, several months ago, was I asked them, "You got to call this thing something. What is this?" And what I was told was, this is by the guy that basically designed this uh, UI, it's just Windows. That's it, Windows. Said, we, we're not calling it anything. It's just Windows. And I've been kind of making fun of that, you know, <laughs> ever since. But the thing is, I, in many ways, they're on, they're on message there, right? I guess they um, are. But I mean, when, when, the when desktop you're in certain... Sticker, you know what the desktop is in Windows 8 and Windows RT? It's an app. It's yeah. a legacy app. They actually updated it in Windows 8 
because they had kind of had to. I think they threw people that bone. The desktop in Windows 8 is better than it was in You know, well, the reason why I think it's difficult for many people to to understand this, and so, it, I mean, it's difficult for me, too, because I'm a power user when it comes to PCs, and I have specific applications that do specific things for me, mm -hmm. and I can't see it existing in Metro. But, but Okay, but you got to remember something. Metro doesn't stay still. Metro right now, it's not even fair to call it Metro 1.0. It's like Metro 0.8. You need to understand that Metro is going to evolve dramatically. It has to. And that, that's the desktop my point. can't yeah. disappear until Metro can do everything that the desktop does. And until Metro handles multitasking right. in a, better in multitasking a is much a better problem. way, I, I feel people are not going to understand it. But that's the next step for Metro. Now that they have this UI here and the future of Windows has been kind of implemented, yep. now they need to tweak it as, and say, okay... What are people happen. doing it's in the real happen. world? What do we need to tweak here? And I think multitasking is the biggest. Yeah. No, I mean the desktop thing that they kind of you know, The desktop's going to be one of those things where like uh, they'll they'll cart it along in, in future Windows versions because they kind of have to, and it will be like this legacy feature. And then eventually they'll make it so that you could actually not have it on there if you don't want it. And then eventually they'll just get rid of it. Yeah. You know? Well, someone brought up something interesting. You go, hey Andrew, can you do your your webcast on a tablet with Paul? I don't think I'll ever be able to do that. Uh, there's actually, so <laughs> that's uh, almost a nonsensical question. Could you do your tablet on a multi-touch based all in one PC or could you do your uh, podcast on a, uh, just a regular desktop computer that had a uh, multi-touch yeah. 27 inch screen? Of course you could. Of course you could. For me, I, I don't know. You know, it's, it's all this is, is in its imagine, infancy. No, but so it's imagine you could take the screen in front of you, yeah, pull it down at an angle and have it in front of you and you could have your hands resting on it as if it were like a like a piano keyboard, except it's angled up toward you. And that this thing is your dashboard and you're controlling the sound levels and you're doing all this stuff. You're telling me that you couldn't do the podcast like that? Of course you could. It would be wonderful. It would be so much better than using a keyboard and a mouse. Well, no, I, I think his point is with, with the amount of, with the interface and with the power that's needed to do this. But why, can't, why wouldn't that be a full-fledged PC? I'm not saying it's a tablet. I'm saying I mean, it's an actual desktop computer. Of course it is. I, I, I guess. I mean, we're looking... To yeah, how, until the chips the are so fast, I, I can't. I know. Well, ten years from now, who knows? <laughs> no, it's not ten years from now. It's like two years from now. I want a gigantic computer, Paul. Don't you understand? I want a tower this big with fans going out from every side. I always thought I wanted that too, but I think the truth yeah. is, this stuff just becomes more pervasive and more integrated into our lives, and that the, you know, this it's it, this big box stuff that we do today. I think that kind of goes away. Well, people. listen, most people don't need it. I'm, I'm actually looking to replace my Skype machines with these little uh, net top boxes. Sure. You know, the tiny little boxes, uh, they're dual core whatever's in them. Uh, and they'll be able to do HD Skype video. So who knows? Maybe in a couple of years, I'll be able to produce everything. We actually had a big meeting. Uh, and, and, and this is when uh, a lot of Microsoft people start crying. We may <laughs> be moving over. If we don't go over to a TriCaster, we may be going over to a Mac for a video. If you do that, a little part of me is going to die. <laughs> I know. I know. We'll I see refuse, what happens. I refuse to be broadcast over a Mac. Over a Mac. That, you're, you're putting your foot down on that. You're fine with <laughs> me having the MacBook, little, Pro. Yeah. the MacBook Pro. The MacBook Pro is not a problem. The Hackintosh is not even a problem, but the main machine cannot be a Mac. No, I like the Hackintosh because it subverts OS X. I think that's uh, there's a part of me that sort of respects that. All right. Time for the, uh, the what if of the week. Mm. And this is something we discussed in the past, but we never... Gave it as a what if segment, and we've speculated that Microsoft may move to yearly updates. Well, because they will, <laughs> and I believe that too. But yeah. how is that going to play out if they go to a yearly update, a yearly release to well, their next version? Yeah, you got to stop thinking about Windows the way we think about it now, right? So now we have these versions, right? It's like Windows eight, Windows seven, you know. Uh, or internally, it's Windows six point something, you know, whatever. Um, I really don't think that that model is makes sense in this new world that we're talking about you know that everything kind of changes and and the way that they update windows is honestly just a small part of the big picture because part of this involves this notion of you know how you brand windows how you sell windows you know uh, apple sells a new version of os 10 for what 19 or 29 dollars whatever it is uh, microsoft is now doing that with windows 8 where it's like 40 dollars um, this is a way to this is all, these are all parts of this giant change that's occurring. Like software just doesn't get created in this monolithic way anymore. So yeah. Apple has, it's weird because you think about this, a couple of versions of OS X ago, Apple said that they were slowing down OS X development. Remember this? And they, were, they weren't going to do a yearly release like they were doing for a while. 
and that the rationale behind it was we don't need to do that anymore. You know, OS 10 has matured to the point where we don't need to do that. But for the past two versions, they've been coming out in kind of a yearly cycle. So kind of smaller targeted releases and so forth. But I actually think Microsoft is going to turn it in a completely different direction in that what's going to come out a year from now is not, or nine months from now, by the way. I don't think it's actually going to even be a year. I think it's going to be less than that. But I think it's going to be just updates to Windows in that the Windows, for now we have to call it Windows 8 because that's what it's called. It's Windows 8. And so Windows 8 today is brand new. It's a new name. And so we like that kind of thing. And so Windows 8 Update 1 or Windows 8 SP1 or Windows Update Feature Pack 1, or it doesn't matter what they call it, but whatever this thing is, it will retain the Windows 8 branding because we want people to know that this is something new for Windows 8. Yeah. You know, that you get for free. And that as part of this free deal, you're going to get software updates, of course, like you would in a service pack. You're going to get functional updates. It will do that thing where between now and that first update, every single app in Windows 8 will have been updated several times. There's no doubt about it. Many times in some cases, right? There'll be constant updating of the apps. But if you were to buy Windows 8 after a certain date and you get this update one thing as part of it, those apps are all updated in there. You know, they're all that's all part of it. It's just like yeah, part but of do the you, do, you, do you feel that they're going to do major UI tweaks with these incremental updates or do you think they'll wait for a major change? I think they have change? to do major UI tweaks. Yeah. Yes, I think that has to be part of it because they can't they can't let this thing sit still. And so and by the way, UI updates again, actually it's that's not even far reaching enough. They have to do major API updates, major uh, foundational updates as well, right? I mean, the, there, there's just, for example, um, it's not necessarily a good example, but this is one example. Um, Windows, the Windows Phone API, I'm sorry, the Windows 8 APIs, the WinRT APIs, are 1.0, right? They're yeah. really basic. There's a lot of kind of functionality in there that's not in there. Um, if you look at the Windows Phone APIs, you can do something like um, tell me something about this device I'm running on. I want to know what the manufacturer name is. I want to know what the model number is. And then the, the writer of that app could have some kind of a database about what capabilities are in these devices and so forth. There's no way in Windows 8 in, that I'm aware of, it's certainly not the way you do it on Windows Phone, to say, am I using a tablet? You know, yeah. Am I using a touch screen? Am I using a device that has a screen that is seven inches big? Or is it nine? You, know, you, you don't get that kind of information. You don't, certainly don't get the manufacturer or the device number. And so, again, not a great example, but an example of where, because Windows Phone has been around a couple of years longer, they already have this kind of stuff in the APIs where Windows 8 does not. And so those APIs need to, you know, they need to grow and, and adapt. And so I think they will. Yeah, I I, I think it's, it's extremely important to have these yearly releases of the operating system. I, I, we're in a different time now. I mean, you've said it before too, Paul. It's yeah. not 1995 anymore that you could wait three years to do a major change, people want. By the way, people want it now. Uh, um, we talked about the book that I'm working on uh, for Windows Phone 8. This new way of doing things. Um, there's a way to look at that too that correlates to what we're talking about with the OSs. You know, in the old days, meaning like two weeks ago, you would publish a book on paper and maybe now an ebook format, and it would sit there unchanged for years. And then you would write some other book, and then that thing would go out. That's a very monolithic way of doing it. Yeah. You know, part of the reason I want to change the way I do these books is to adapt to the way that the, the world has changed. And I think that Windows needs to adapt in exactly the same way. It needs to be something that you have to be able to update continuously. It has to be like that. I mean, otherwise, it's not this modern new thing. You know, Windows 8 is not Windows 7 plus Metro. Windows 8 is a new brand thing. new mobile operating system for Microsoft that happens to include, for now, the Windows desktop. And that new mobile operating system needs to be updated at least once a year. And I bet it's going to be more than that. I bet it's going to be quicker than a year. Do uh, you think, oh, quicker than a year? Well, um, yeah, probably yeah. for the first one, we'll probably see something faster. I think if you look at Windows 8 three years from now, whenever you know, like a Windows Totally, totally like, different than what it is now. Yeah, I think it's going to be totally different. Yeah. I, it, well, unless, you know, and this is the other thing. Are they going to constantly call go by numbers, or do you think they'll just call it Windows like they have, you know, in Nazi yeah, operating system? I think system. that's part of it. You know, so uh, as part of the tech ed event that I was at, there were two things that we had to be very careful not to say on stage. Uh, one was Metro, which I'm happy to say I successfully navigated around. Um, and the other one was Office 2013. They did not want us to say Office 2013. They it's were Office. very specific. This thing is called the all new Office. Yeah. Yeah. Well, very, listen, very it's very specific. They want to get people away from this thing where you think about it as a version number. There'll always be version numbers. There, there have to be. You, you know, 
you have to be able to understand what the differences are between different you know, versions of the software. But uh, they have, want people to start calling it Office. Have they hinted that they're going to start calling it animal names? <laughs> I don't know. Like the, like yeah, the yeah. Windows Golden Retriever version? Right. Knowing Microsoft, they would pick like feral cats. Feral or, cat, yeah. You know, maybe like rodents or something. Tabby. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I'm, I'm excited for it, Paul. I really am. And and I at this time, I know a lot of people can't grip that, you know, this is where we're headed. But you have to look at the future of the of the operating system. And you have, Windows Hippo, that's perfect. Yeah. Uh, and you have to look at it in three years, you know. And, I, and probably in a year or two, we're going to look back and be like, wow, th this was really different than what we have now. Well, th right. And, and there will probably always be this notion of, you know, monolith or not monolithic, but, you know, major Windows versions. You know, in some ways, you, you, you always want to have something to sell, I guess. But um, if you were to buy Windows, like let's say we just call it Windows at some point, you know. Uh, well, well, which version of Windows do you have? You know, it shouldn't matter because in the world of this near future, no matter how you acquire Windows, um, you should always be updated to the most recent version as you get it. You know, if you're electronically distributing Windows to customers, you're always going to distribute the new version, right? You're not going to sell Windows 7 as it was three years ago. Yeah. You're going to sell it as it is now, you know? Yeah. That's the way it is. And, and of course, that's the way Windows has evolved. I mean, Windows... Uh, has automatic updating, has had that for a long, long time. If you're going to run setup over the web now and not from a local disk that you've made, well, that thing can be up to date now. It doesn't have to be set in stone like it was the day you created that DVD. Yeah. I think these things are all important and tied together. Very cool stuff. Uh, Paul, so your book, before we wrap it up. Yep. Available now. Windows 8 Secrets. Is, Windows yep. 8 Secrets is available. Uh, Amazon, uh, pretty much everywhere, right? I would imagine, yeah, I don't. Pretty much everywhere, so you could get it. We're going to be doing a couple of giveaways on the show in the coming weeks, so uh, we're going to keep you posted on that. And yes. uh, and you're writing your next book, and you're doing something different. So, do you want to rehash it a little bit and let the audience know what you're doing exactly with it? Yeah. So for the next book, I'm going to write about Windows Phone 8. It's going to be uh, done online. It, it it's going to be done transparently. You know, so in the past, I would write a book. Uh, either by myself or with Raphael most recently, and we would go back and forth about it. We'd send it into the publisher. They would review it uh, multiple times, actually, very painful process. Send it back for, you know, <laughs> for your feedback and all that kind of stuff. Um, now I'm going to do all that stuff transparently as I write it, and so the first thing I'm going to write about is that calendar app that's on Windows Phone, and I'll just publish that chapter as I kind of write it. You know, there'll yeah. be little bits of it, and then finally a full chapter, and then eventually other chapters will become part of that document, and hopefully what will happen, and we'll see, is people will provide feedback on that, not just on the, the writing of it or the, the stuff I've chosen to cover, and hopefully it will be complete and, and uh, comprehensive, but also, you know, the structure of the book. I mean, it doesn't, I've been writing books for a long, long time, and I structure things in a very certain way, but maybe that's not the most efficient way to translate or to communicate that information. And so I'm hoping that people, I, I have a feeling there's going to be some oh, I don't know, kind of epiphany that somebody has or someone will just come up with some idea that's obvious to them and it will be like an epiphany to me because I just never see things that way and that it will change the book in some very dramatic and positive way. You know, But that this thing will be online as a living document and as changes come to Windows Phone 8, I'll be able to update the book and it will be made available in every possible format you can imagine, all of the electronic ver uh, yeah. document formats, uh, PDF and EPUB and Mobi and I'll publish it on you know the Amazon stuff and... I'm still waiting. App. I'm still waiting for the audio version. The audio version. I can't promise an audio version. That would be ponderous and <laughs> awful. And I would like. Update. I would like it very. You know, slow, slow paced like and yeah, yeah. very, very, very long. Yeah, baby. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Chapter thirteen. I don't know. I don't see that happening. But all right, guys. Time to wrap it up. <laughs> uh, you can check out Paul's website, winsuperside.com. Also, uh, Paul does a great podcast, Windows Weekly, on the Twit Network every Thursday at 2 p.m. East. Uh, you could also follow him on Twitter, at The Rot. I'm at Andrew Zarian on Twitter. You can follow me. I sometimes drink a little too much after 8 o'clock and start yelling about CNN writers. <laughs> I don't really. I'll yeah. continue my personal yeah. vendetta. Against CNN, yeah. <laughs> Against well. CNN money. CNN money, not necessarily CNN, but CNN money right, is who right. I'm going after. I might go after Sports Illustrated also. Why? What have I've, they done? Nothing. Just, just picking people. 
my future is going to be, I think I'm going to run a newspaper in a small town and just turn it into something high quality. You know, I read like the Boston Globe and it drives me crazy how bad the writing is. But if you want to see something really pathetic, you got to pick up the Dedham Times someday. It's basically a high school quality newspaper. <laughs> is it that uh, bad? With, oh, it's, oh, it's just so horrible. Uh, and, I think, uh, I think it's, it's just writing in general. I Oxford. Just want to, I just want to fix it. You know, I yeah. just want to fix it. Just uh, before we wrap it up, Oxford commas, guys. Come on, let's start using them. What is it? Oxford commas. Oxford commas. Yeah, like, you know, when you write, um, Paul went to the store, he bought eggs, milk, <laughs> and tuna. They and you don't. Want the, last, the last comma? Is I want the comma before the and. I want to be very clear about that because I actually feel very strongly about this, even though I never knew that was called Oxford commas. You always have to have the last comma before the end. Always. People and don't do it. I know. It drives me crazy. Oh, I, I, and listen, I'm not. I'm I not always a, do it. You can find anything I've written. I've, I always do it. Always have the last comma. I'm not, I'm not a great writer, but I'm just, I've been editing a lot, and people don't know where to put commas. Ever. Not having a last comma is such an arbitrary and weird thing. It's just not consistent. But you know what's funny? I don't remember ever learning it in school weird I, it's like been I so noted, long since i was in school i can't remember but i went to a new york school new york city public school where they taught you how to make sh shanks and just stab people oh, we had a class about that all right guys uh go to our website guys from queens.com if you miss any portion of the show it's going to be available via podcast on gfknetwork.com also on winsupersite.com and uh, until next time guys uh, remember when you're making a in a shank uh, remember to sharpen the edge uh, and, and dig deep. Good night, everybody.